Hello, ahoy and namaste, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Love Your Zoo Live. We're here at Jersey Zoo, headquarters of the international animal charity, Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. So many amazing people work for Durrell, both here at the zoo and around the world. Each and every one of them has a shared passion for saving some of the rarest and most threatened animals on the planet from extinction. Stay with us as we meet some of the experts behind our vital work and of course, the wonderful animals themselves. And we wanna hear from you as well. So please get in touch with your comments, your questions, or if you just wanna share the love of the zoo. We've got questions for Chris Packham coming up a little bit later. So join him, hashtag love your zoo live on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Now, in a few moments, we're going to be chatting to the CEO of Durrell, Dr. Leslie Dickey, about the Love Your Zoo campaign. Here's what else is coming up on Love Your Zoo Live. I've been out and about seeing conservation in the field. The red field chuffs were extinct in Jersey for over a century, but Durrell and its partners have been on the case. And we'll be going live to the team in Montserrat, who, with the help of keepers here at the zoo, are part of an extraordinary project to save one very special frog, with a very unusual name. And we're also gonna be chatting to some of the keepers who are looking after two of our precious newborns, the very rare and elusive Ai Ai, and of course, our beautiful baby gorilla. We'll be chatting to actor and Durrell ambassador, Milo Parker about playing young Jerry and his time last year at the zoo. But before we go there or anywhere, we'd like to show you a short film that really gets to the heart of why we're here today. In a great, endless universe where life is so rare. We're surrounded and protected by, by a layer of air. air. On a planet of wonder, made of oceans and lands. Whose future rests in all of our hands. Its surface is covered in wonderful things. That walk and talk and think and swim with lizards and plants and fishes and birds and insects and mammals that travel in herds. It's a land full of trees that reach for the sky. With birds, bats and bugs flap their wings and fly. Where armies of ants form nice tidy lines as they march across forests and fungus and vines. Where colourful creatures of all shapes and sizes live out their lives as the sun sets and rises. Some sleep in the day and come out at night. While others prefer to play when it's light. Where raindrops make rivers that flow to the sea. So that creatures of all colours can roam far and free. Where web-footed critters paddle and play as wave after wave rise and fall every day. In an endless universe where life is so rare, there's a precious planet and wild things share. It's a place of wonder filled with colourful lands. And its future health rests in our powerful hands. Rewild ourselves Wild our world. Now, mums and dads, have you ever seen your child putting dirt or earthworms into their mouth? No need to worry. Our first guest did that too. And then today, a brilliant artist, an author, and CEO of Doral Wildlife Conservation Trust. Dr. Leslie Dickey, thank you very much, <laughs> and welcome to Love Your Zoo Live. Thank you very much, Dan. What a memory that is for a child. Very profound memory. It's actually my earliest memory. It was my big brother told me to eat an earthworm. So I did. But I can still, today, I can still feel the taste in my mouth. I can still feel the texture. And uh, at Durrell, I think we know that these early nature experiences can have a really profound effect. I think it's probably partly why I'm here today. Wow. Yeah, really did 
build a strong bond with nature then. A very the visceral connection to nature. Now, a lot of people around Jersey, around the world, are very proud of Jersey Zoo yeah. and very proud of Dole. We've just launched the Love Your Zoo campaign. Why did we do that? Well, there's this small problem we have in the world right now, the global pandemic of COVID. And, uh, of course, it's impacting people in all kinds of ways from, you know, very sadly, it's resulting in people's deaths, but there's also the impact it's having on everyday life um, across the globe in um, how we go about our, our business, our life, our, our, our um, daily activity. And here at the zoo, we have been impacted as well. And with the zoo being closed for several weeks and the closure of our borders until recently, it's had a pretty devastating impact on our income. Um, we want to survive well into the future because there's so much that we have to do. And so we've really been reaching out to all our supporters worldwide and Love Your Zoo is about how they can help us be that uh, thriving organisation into the future so we can continue the kind of work we're going to hear about this evening. We just watched a fantastic video and the, the children there talk about the power in our hands, the responsibility, I guess, that we have. And we also talk in our vision of a wilder, healthier, more colourful world. And it's really interesting, I guess, now about the healthier. What is it in Dole's work that yeah. makes a healthier world? Well, yeah, I think people sometimes uh, gloss over that part of our vision statement that says healthier. But at Durrell, we really believe in that idea of a, a one planet health approach. And essentially, it's a kind of Venn diagram of people, planet and animals. With a, a healthy uh, planet, there's no healthy people, no healthy animals, no healthy people, no healthy animals, etc. And the pandemic, you know, we see how this pandemic started. It was about bringing a virus that was perfectly at home in its own environment and bringing it crashing into our world um, and look at the consequence. So this pandemic that we're facing is a consequence of how we treat biodiversity. So the health bit has always been a part of Durrell and in some ways through protecting species and habitats uh, we've been in the business of trying to mitigate pandemic risk and this has really brought it home. We've got projects all around the world and yeah. I guess as CEO it's been a particularly challenging uh, period for yeah. you. How are our overseas projects doing? Well it is challenging because of course all our projects are at different stages of this pandemic. You know it's called a wave for a reason so it's crashing in some places. Perhaps on here on Jersey we're coming out of it to some extent. And um, in places like Madagascar, for example, where we have a really big uh, field component, lots and lots of staff, they're in a situation where it's increasing rapidly. Um, now, our first port of call when we think about that is the health of our own staff. We want to keep them as safe as possible. And then we've got to think about how can we continue our work? Uh, how do we still try and help the local communities that we work with? Because again, if you think in Madagascar, those local communities, rural communities, they're facing COVID, but every day they're facing possible malaria risks, mm -hmm. cholera, plague. This is the, the other thing on top. So we have to try and make sure we can also support those communities and try and get our work done. A lot of our staff actually are helping in those communities in a COVID capacity, I believe, as well. They are. I mean, if we go to India, um, the head of our programme in India, Parag, uh, very early on, he could see that local communities were not receiving the right kind of hygiene advice about hand washing and face masks, etc. And so Parag took it upon himself to go to local communities, start giving the information, start helping people prepare. And that's really part of the DNA of, of how we operate. We are part of communities where we work, whether it's here on Jersey, or whether it's in India, or whether it's Mauritius, Madagascar, or, or wherever it is. And so we also have a responsibility in many places for human health. There's a lot of talk about biodiversity and climate change. Are they the same thing? No, not the same thing at all. You quite often see people talk about climate change in an all-encompassing way. But biodiversity loss is the other great challenge of the 21st century. That's the two big things we need to consider, climate change and biodiversity loss. Now, they, they interact with each other, uh, they overlap. You could say they're two sides of the same coin. But there's specific things we can address about each. 
And so in some ways, um, climate change in terms of getting it on the agenda has been highly successful. But we also need to make sure that people's perception of uh, what could be the consequences of biodiversity loss is also on the agenda because it's a huge consequence for humanity. Um, reports just in the newspaper today from a large study in America looking at the decline of pollinators and the impact that's going to have on human food crops. So we need to be addressing both climate change and biodiversity loss. Okay, well there's, there's a lot to, to get through. Um, what would you say to anybody watching this tonight and thinking, I'd like to support animals, I'd like to be a part of what Durrell is doing. How can they get involved? Lots of ways they can get involved. Um, we have uh, ways to donate. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, there'll be links to how we donate. Um, you could become a member of the zoo here on Jersey if you're not a member. Uh, you could uh, go to our online shop, come to our actual shop. We've got lots of uh, very ethical get goods to buy. Get those t-shirts. Get, get those amazing t-shirts. You can you know, sponsor activities, be a fundraiser, you know, do a challenge event. There's just so many different ways that people can help. And we, we've seen some amazing response already, which has been really heartening to see the support both here on Jersey and also our community around the world. Fantastic. Now, we're hopefully getting some questions through from social media as well. So, um, Emma, have we got an update from the social media side of um, things? We have indeed. So, we're get, getting a few comments on social media, which is absolutely fantastic. So, our first question is, how did animals behave during lockdown? Mm. And how did they respond to seeing visitors again? Well, all the animals, you know, they're, they're different being different species, but they're also individuals. Um, I think definitely some of the animals missed seeing more people. Now, of course, the zoo didn't stop. The zoo still operated, just there was not visitors. So the animals were still seeing lots of people, the people who look after them. Um, but if you take, you know, species like Homer the Hornbill, who really loves to chat to people, um, you know, I think he missed the chat. Um, we noticed that when people came back for some of the species, they seemed really quite excited. There was lots of vocalization and other species, okay, they're, they're not so bothered. So it's a very individual thing. Um, so that, that variation, you know, the, the individual keepers who are looking after the animals could probably tell you more insights about what actually happened. Yeah, I remember actually, uh, so one of our RAN keepers actually told some of the other keepers of the zoo that oh if you've got some mm. time on your lunch break go and walk past the orangs and say hello so yeah it's interesting how there is that sort of different response from different animals particularly so. netty orangutan who loves looking in people's bags that's one of her favorite activities and she missed having people come in and say look what's in my bag today <laughs> <laughs> well it's good they can experience that again um, and then our next question is what would happen if there was another sort of wave of covid on jersey like how would yeah. you respond to that do you think well, the one thing that we have learned during this whole process is we now know what it's like to live in a pandemic. You know, my grandparents lived through a pandemic, the Spanish flu. You know, I'm here today because they survived a pandemic. You know, these, is, these are things that happen, but we've not had a big shock like this to our generation until now. So we've learned a lot about how we look after both the people and the animals safely. Uh, we've, we've learned um, what systems we have to put in place. Now, we'll keep our fingers crossed that there's not a second wave on Jersey. Um, but if there was, we can cope with that second wave in terms of we know what to do. And I think for all of us, it's a learning experience. Uh, so an update now on our fundraising. We're really pleased to say that the Just Giving page is currently at over £78,000. So... Thank you wow. very much to people who have contributed Thank you to so that. Much. That's absolutely fantastic. And so, yeah, it's, your support really does mean so much to us. And there's been so many amazing fundraising efforts, hasn't there? I mean, yeah. I think your family's been doing yeah, so Yeah, we've well. been <laughs> drawing and people have been dancing and running and swimming. It, there's so many different ways you can get involved. There's so many different ways to get inspired or support people who are trying to help species through Dole. So please check out the, the Just Giving page and get inspired yourself. Leslie, thank you so much. You're thank gonna you. You're going to stick around for us. I'm sticking around. Excellent. <laughs> um, now, Emma, this week you have been hopping around the zoo, haven't you? <laughs> um, yes, hopping really is the correct word to, hear, to, to use in this situation. So I got to spend some time over in our amphibian and reptile house chatting to our head of herpetology, 
herpetology Matt Gotts about the work to save a very special frog native to the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean. But before we do that, here's a little look at how you can help our Love Your Zoo campaign. Jersey Zoo is the heartbeat of Durrell, and without it, the charity cannot survive. We need your help to provide the expert care to our beloved animals and to continue our work creating a wilder, healthier, more colourful world. Please show your love for Jersey Zoo by visiting us, donating to our Love Your Zoo appeal, joining as a member, adopting one of our amazing animals, shopping at our gift shop or online, staying in our award-winning wildlife camp. Together, with your help, we can ensure Jersey Zoo endures this global crisis and thrives into the future. Hi Matt, how are you doing today? Hi, Emma. I hear you've got you something doing? very special to show me. I have. Excellent, let's go have a look. Show you. So Matt, what have we come to look at today? Well, today I wanted to show you the mountain chicken frogs. Um, as you know, we have plenty to show you, but we wanted to pick that particular one because it shows very specially how important the zoo is to save particular species. So I want to show you the mountain chicken and tell you a little bit more what we did in the zoo to save it in the field. The mountain chicken frog is as endangered as a species gets, really. There is maybe 150 animals left in the wild, they originally only occurred on Montserrat and Dominica, the islands in the Caribbean. On Montserrat, it has gone now. And on Dominica, yeah, it's just about 150 animals left. Wow. And why exactly did it go endangered? Um, apart from the usual, you know, threats that species have, like the mountain chicken as well, like habitat destruction, um, pollution, all these kind of things, the main thing that really got it so much into danger was the chytrid fungus. The chytrid fungus is a disease, a fungal disease, that infects the skin of amphibians, only amphibians. Um, and it makes it impermeable for water and air. So a lot of species die. There are some species which are you know, more susceptible than others, but the mountain chicken frog has turned out to be extremely susceptible to it. So at what point did we at Jersey Zoo get involved with this project to help save the species? We got first involved with the mountain chicken on Montserrat after the big volcano outbreak in 1997, which destroyed half the island completely. And Montserrat government got in touch with us and asked, you know, what is the status of the mountain chicken after the destruction of more than half its habitat? Because it's a very traditionally important uh, animal for the island. It has been hunted for food for centuries at least. And it is also one of the biggest frogs in the world and definitely the biggest frogs, frog in the Caribbean. So you mentioned they're hunting for food. Is that where they get their name from? It, uh, potentially, yes. We are not 100% sure. Nobody can actually tell because it's probably too long ago that it has first been called mountain chicken. And also the call is a little bit, is very loud and, and, and it's not a really frog-like call. So. Even though it doesn't sound like a chicken, it might be that both the taste and the call and definitely the mountain um, combined led to the term mountain chicken. What would have happened to the species, do you think, without Jersey Zoo? I would say the species would most likely be completely extinct. So definitely um, on Montserrat, as it is now, although we have put frogs back just recently, a few months ago, um, but also the population, the tiny, tiny population on, on Dominica um, might not have had as quick an intervention as it had because, you know, we wouldn't have researched the mountain chicken before, we wouldn't have had them in captivity and found out how very specialized they are in terms of their breeding. Um, it might not have received enough attention that it actually, you know, would have been saved uh, and, 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 and taken care of uh, quickly enough. So what exactly are we doing at the moment to help save the species? You mentioned a release going on? Yeah, the latest thing we did was we released um, frogs into Montserrat last July, so exactly a year ago from now. Um, so they were bred in zoos, in captivity, and we sent them back and we have a huge um, multi-year research project on Montserrat 
we have fenced in an area of forest of their natural habitat and we modified that in a way that we hope we can find out how they can live with the chytrid fungus in Montserrat without dying. It's fascinatingly interesting and also will have so much impact on other amphibian species. Why do you think Jersey Zoo is so important for conservation? Well, there is, there's a lot of roles that really can only be achieved in the zoo. So one thing I mentioned, we released frogs that we've bred in the zoo. You can also you potentially breed those frogs or other species in the field and then release them. But you still need the knowledge how to breed them and how to keep them. You cannot learn this within like a year or so in the field by trying uh, try and error, especially when you work with endangered species. You need decades of experience and you only get that in a zoo. So that's why it's so incredibly important. We, we not just have our conservation projects, but also the zoo and this building and, and our staff here. The story does not end there. We are now going to go live to Montserrat to speak to Luke Jones, who is the coordinator for the Mountain Chicken Recovery Programme. So, hi Luke, how are you doing today? Hi Emma, I'm doing really well, thank you. How are you? Not too bad, thank hey, you. Hey Luke, <laughs> weather looks good again. It always is, mate, always is. <laughs> Beautiful. Right, I'm going to go and check out the social media. <laughs> so Luke, first of all, just give us a bit of background to the picture of Congress. So just how severe was the outbreak in Montserrat? Well, to put it this way, when the fungus first arrived in Dominica alone, we saw an 80% decline in the species in just 18 months. Then when it arrived on Montserrat, a much smaller island, it was phenomenal how quickly it spread through the population. And they just plummeted. The guys who were working in the field with them at the time described just walking through the forest and coming across ponds filled with dead frogs. And it was almost overnight. So... It, 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 was, it was phenomenal, the, the impact that it had on this species. Um, without the proper intervention that we had with Jersey Zoo and our partners, it seems that the species wouldn't have survived at all in the wild, just after their own devices. Wow, so really incredible work we're doing there. So um, Matt mentioned in his video that you guys have created these enclosures to help combat the kit trick. Can you just explain a bit about how that works? Okay, so... What we know from working with Kitrid in the lab is we know this doesn't tolerate temperatures well. And from previous releases, we saw that during the hotter seasons of the year, the fungus actually decreased in its virility and the frogs were able to survive when it was in this kind of low presence. So the idea is that over time, between moving between hot and cold areas within the enclosure, they should be exposed to the fungus, challenged by it, but then able to survive alongside it. And hopefully in time, we should see an adaptation and a certain level of resilience build up within the population so that we can then release them back into the wild without the need for such interventions. Wow, so the frogs basically have their own jacuzzi? Basically, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely amazing. And uh, Matt also mentioned that video that you guys have done a release from Jersey Zoo into Montserrat. So can you tell us a yes. bit about that? We have. So that was just last year. So in, in July of last year, we flew over 28 mountain chickens, some of which have been bred at Jersey Zoo, and reintroduced them back into Montserrat. So this was the first time actually the mountain chickens had been back on the island in two years since our previous release attempts. Um, so is this the first time that they were sort of on the island? What was the reaction then from you and the local community when you heard them calling for the first time in years on Montserrat? Well, bear in mind that for a lot of the guys working on the project, they've invested half their lifetime in trying to reintroduce this species. Um, for me, I'd only been working on the project for a year, and it was just so completely overwhelming because there's, there is this real presence on Montserrat with the absence of the frogs. It, it seems quiet at night. You're walking through the forest, and you know you should be hearing this really enigmatic call coming down through the forest, and you know that that's what generations of Montserratians grew up listening to, and it's just not there. And we've been working trying to devise these technologies for a year. And, you know, you're going out and you're doing long night workouts in the field and you're not finding any frogs. But then to be able to reintroduce them back and to hear them calling once again on island for the first time, it was just, it was completely overwhelming. And you've got these seasoned field workers, like almost in tears, you know, welling up. And it's not just them, it's the local community too. People here, for, considering we're working with a frog, the amount of people here who are so engaged and interested in what we're doing because they so profoundly feel the loss of the species from the island. It's, it's really phenomenal. Oh, 
Oh, that sounds incredible. And so what, what is the role in Jersey Zoo in all this? Do you think they've had such a huge impact on restoring the Mount Kipu Montserrat then? Yeah, well, it's, as I said before, I think if it wasn't the intervention of Jersey Zoo and the other zoos we work with, there is no way that mon the mountain chicken would be surviving. And, you know, quite often you hear people talking about conservation projects and they, they're saying, well, shouldn't we be conserving species within, their own, within the natural setting? And that's all good and well until you get down to the situation where the mountain chicken was at, where the wild setting is no longer suitable. You know, you've got maybe the habitat has um, been destroyed to such an extent that they, it no longer supports them or you have an outbreak of disease like you did with Cotridia mycosis. And all of a sudden, the role of zoos just becomes so prevalent because it's they really act as our one safety net for these species, and they provide such valuable learning opportunities and chances for us to develop these innovative techniques to hopefully save these species that otherwise would be lost without our help. Beautiful. And uh, so, just one final question: What is next for this project? For the project, well, at the moment, we're still really in the early days. So we've been, we've had the frogs on island and they've been surviving in the presence of this fungus for over a year, which is a record for us. Um, and it's a record that we hope to keep on beating. Obviously, what we want to see is continuing survival. We want to see them gaining weight. We want to see them trying to breathe. We've already seen some of this. We've had over 10 nests already this year and we're really hoping that eventually we're going to see some young coming out of that. But one of the other things that we've been really working on recently is trying to build capacity within the local community and help them develop so that they can continue to manage these projects themselves into the future. So that's what we're doing at the moment. We've actually just received the Darwin grant that's going to help support us in that. So we're actually working to train and develop and engage the youth of Montserrat so they can become the next generation of wildlife conservationists working here in the Caribbean. So, you know, we have our species focus with the mountain chicken and our goals there, but also our focus for the youth and um, for the role that they can play in the future conservation of the wildlife in this region. Excellent. Well, it looks like you guys are doing absolutely fantastic work over there once we're out. Well done for continuing Thank you. with it all. Now, I think we're going to go to a few questions from social media. If Dan we are. We've got loads of questions. Luke, everybody wants to know how you got your job. Montserrat, <laughs> Ireland. What a dream. Yeah, well, it's the same process. I think with conservation, it can be quite competitive, you know, and it's for a lot of the, the youth, you know, young people looking out there and inspiring towards careers. I would say just don't give up on what you're working towards and think about maybe the side routes that you can take. So for me, a big part of um, what helped me get the role was not only um, the degree that I did, but I also focused on um, trying to look outside the box. So I, I ended up working as an outreach officer at a zoo, and that just gives you a whole different skill set separate to um, separate to the scientific side. So, you know, if you can communicate things well and you can engage people, that's that's a, a useful skill set. So start looking for those side roads whilst you're working towards your goal, but don't lose that long term vision, you know, and be willing to take take a risk. I started off just going in for a research assistant role and it's, you know, take those risks and see how those opportunities develop is what I would say. We'd also got comments here just thanking you for all your work on, on Monster Rat. Um, the people are watching from all around the world here, so there's a lot of love coming in. And we've also had donations as well, so thank you so much for them. Coming up, we'll be sharing with you some of the adorable babies born at the zoo over the past year. But first, in case you've forgotten, here's a little reminder on how you can help us out. Jersey Zoo is the heartbeat of Durrell and without it, the charity cannot survive. We need your help to provide the expert care to our beloved animals and to continue our work creating a wilder, healthier, more colorful world. Please show your love for Jersey Zoo by visiting us, donating to our Love Your Zoo appeal, joining as a member, adopting one of our amazing animals, shopping at our gift shop or online, staying in our award-winning wildlife camp. Together, with your help, we can ensure Jersey Zoo endures this global crisis and thrives into the future. Hello, um, Chris Packham, naturalist and broadcaster here. Sorry about my slightly unkempt appearance. It's a Covid haircut crossed with a very wild and windy day in the New Forest. Anyway, here's my question, and I fear that it might be quite a difficult one. Um, in simple terms, what are we going to do about ecotourism? Ecotourism. 
because it's very clear that in many parts of the world, ecotourism sustains human communities and also protects the wildlife communities that we care so much about. And yet we're moving into an age where flying, because of environmental concerns, is increasingly a difficult thing to justify. So how can we travel to places to protect the wildlife that we love so much whilst that travelling process is so damaging? Secondly, in the age of Covid, perhaps no one will want to jump on an aeroplane immediately and sustain those communities which are entirely dependent on our ecotourism. And there is a grave fear, of course, that they may switch to other means of exploiting the wildlife, not positive ones, but negative ones, perhaps going back to poaching. And whether that's everyday species or endangered species is of equal concern because it will lead to disastrous impacts on the ecosystems that we care so much about. So what are we going to do? What are you and I going to do about ecotourism? Because I've been a clear proprietor of ecotourist ventures and I've been traveling the world and I've been promoting those and I've been trying to do it in a proper and right way. But at this point in time, I've got to tell you two things. One, I don't want to get on an aircraft because of my personal and my family's and my friend's safety in light of the corona crisis. And two, I'm increasingly concerned about justifying my carbon footprint in order to justify my carbon footprint. Difficult question, but one that we have to come up with an answer to. Ecotourism, yeah, it's a huge question. Now, Dr. Dickey, can you answer that for us, please? What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give my personal opinion about this. We spoke earlier, Dan, about the need for the world to recognise that both climate change and biodiversity loss are important. They both are gonna be uh, hugely consequential for humanity. Ecotourism is such a force for good in the world. Um, if we think about global aviation, it accounts for about 2% of all carbon emissions. Deforestation accounts for 10% of all global emissions. My view is, and sometimes a controversial one, I think there's a lot of travel that people do for business that we don't need to. And then there's the travel that we do for love. And I actually think that's the more important travel. We have a personal responsibility to think about how we travel and to mitigate the issues around air travel. Um, but we're in an int interesting period because there are now hybrid prototype passenger jets. So we're in this really interesting period uh, about commercial air travel. Electrification is coming, but not yet. So what do we do now if we do still want to support ethical travel. Well, one way that we can do it, and again, it's not without controversy, is the offsetting market. Some offsets are not brilliant, and we have to accept that they're not brilliant, um, but there are new ones coming onto the market that have really strong co-benefits for the environment. And in fact, it just so happens that Durrell in August is launching our own carbon offset called Rewilding Carbon. Now, this is going to be with our project partners, IPE in Brazil. And it's a project where we're not just planting sticks of carbon in the ground. So over 150 different uh, tree species. It's focusing on species like the black line tamarind. And it helps with local community projects as well. This is a completely um, different kind of offset compared to your standard monoculture type planting schemes. You know, it's chalk and cheese. So that is one way to help mitigate the impact of a flight. And in fact, you can overpay don't just be carbon neutral, be carbon positive about taking your flight and then you're supporting an ecotourism project and you're more than compensating for your flight. So that's where I would be with that. And if we think about the impact of projects when we've reduced ecotourism, you know, it becomes really real. I was talking to a colleague this morning who works in Zimbabwe and they told me this morning that because of the collapse of an ecotourism project due to COVID, poaching is going sky high. That's the consequence if we pull out of these projects. So for me, there's that kind of balanced scorecard approach. What's our total impact? Thoughtful ecotourism is still on the cards for me. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you for your question. And please, everybody else, let us know what you think of the answer. Chris, maybe you've got an answer. But next, we're going to see the eye eyes. First, a quick reminder of how you can help. 
Jersey Zoo is the heartbeat of Durrell, and without it, the charity cannot survive. We need your help to provide the expert care to our beloved animals and to continue our work creating a wilder, healthier, more colourful world. Please show your love for Jersey Zoo by visiting us, donating to our Love Your Zoo appeal, joining as a member, adopting one of our amazing animals, shopping at our gift shop or online, staying in our award-winning wildlife camp. Together, with your help, we can ensure Jersey Zoo endures this global crisis and thrives into the future. Okay, you may have seen our social media poll asking if I eyes are cute or creepy. Those results are coming soon. But first, I want us to get to know I eyes a little bit better. So I called an expert. Rachel is a senior mammal keeper here at Jersey Zoo, and you've been hand rearing a precious baby I eye recently. How's it going? Um, it's going really well, thank you. Um, she's doing amazingly well. She's almost six times her original birth weight um, and she's just starting to practice some of the skills and behaviours that she'll need as an adult. Well, how old is she now? Um, she's just, just over 10 weeks. 10 weeks. So, and what does hand rearing involve? Um, it's pretty labour intensive and it's a 24 hour a day job. Um, so as well as having to feed her every few hours, um, we have to make sure that she stays the right sort of temperature. Um, and although we don't have to deal with changing loads of nappies, um, we do unfortunately have to stimulate her to go to the toilet just as our mum would. Ooh, lovely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and what, what is she eating at the moment? Um, she's basically just drinking milk. Okay. Um, so they don't start eating solids until they're about five, six months old. So oh. we've got a little way to go before she's a bit independent from us. So if she's being fed every two hours, that means you're awake every two hours to, to feed her as well, is that right? Yeah, it was very intensive at the beginning, so it was every two hours uh, wow. throughout the day and night. Um, we've now managed to get it up to a six hour window overnight, so that's, that's quite nice. Oh, the, the, de the dedication of the staff here is second to none, and it's just fantastic to see them in such great hands. Um, what's her name? Because I always thought of I eyes, you know, you could call him Pop I eye or I eye Captain. Oh, Dan, that's terrible. That's why I'm not on names, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? But yeah, yeah, you are never going <laughs> to name any farm mammals, mate. <laughs> um, no, she's actually called Mefali. Um, so we like to choose names that have a bit of meaning behind them and have a nod towards the country that the animal comes from. Um, so Mefali is a Malagasy word, and it means playful, because um, she's had a massively playful nature right from the word go. Um, and it also has a second meaning, which is just perfect for her, which means to rejoice. To rejoice, beautiful. Now, I, I've noticed you've got a couple of things on the, on the table here. There's, there's some bamboo. Um, now, I've seen this before in the zoo. This, this with the hole in. This is where the eye eyes make a little bite or something. Is that right? Yes, so this is what one of the adults has done. Um, so we like to give them their favourite food um, inside bamboo sticks. And I've got some here in case you fancy a snack, Dan. No, you're right. <laughs> no, nice wiggly wax worm. Wow, right. So this is, this is just like breakfast, lunch and dinner. This is a, a lovely meal out for an eye eye. Yeah, it's their, it's their perfect choice, five star okay. restaurant. <laughs> um, and so this is because in the wild, um, they've developed a really amazing behaviour um, so they're a little bit like a woodpecker. So they're kind of the woodpecker of the primate world. Okay. Um, so you might have seen on the video that uh, the eyes have a really, really long middle finger and they've got massive ears. And the reason that they've adapted like this is so that they'll go and find a tree or a, a rotten log and then they'll use that middle finger to tap along and then they'll use their big ears to listen out for insects crawling underneath the bark. Okay. And um, they've also got really big teeth that are massively strong, strong enough to actually chew through concrete. Um, wow, and <laughs> okay. Quite really? amazing. Yeah. Um, and they use those teeth to chew a hole into the bark. And then the bamboo's pretty strong, isn't it's it? Really strong. Well, not as strong as concrete, Dan. So no, uh, okay. <laughs> it's a bit easier for them. Um, but they then use their middle finger to scoop out the insects underneath. And they're able to do that because the middle finger is specially adapted so that it's on a, on a ball and socket joint and can move in all directions. Like, like your, your shoulder or something? Or yeah, your hip. or your yeah, hip. Okay. Yeah, so that insect's got no chance to escape them. Um, so that's, that's something that the adults do every single day here. It's good practice for them. Now, I'm holding up this one. It, there's no holes in it. There's a few little scratches. What's going on there? 
Yeah, so this is one that Mifali has uh, just started oh. practicing on. So okay. I wouldn't mock her too much because she's only got very tiny teeth, Dan. Oh, she's had a go. Yeah, she's, she's had a go. She's, she's having she's, a go on she's it. She's done okay, hasn't she? Now, um, I've read that they're quite a, a mythical creature. There are a lot of folklore and, and history around uh, eye eyes. Has that helped them in the wild or has that kind of hindered their their progress and and things in the wild and um, sadly it's caused a lot of problems um, so these guys are actually nocturnal which means that they come out at night um, and they're also really shy and secretive they spend most of their time wandering around alone um, and so when <laughs> they, they meet up to make they that like it's all right. it. okay <laughs> um, but because they're so shy and elusive and because they look beautiful but slightly interesting looking with their massive ears, long fingers, yellow big eyes, eyes yeah, yeah. big bushy tail. Um, as you said, there's a bit of folklore around them and people think that they, they are a bad omen, that they could bring sort of ill fortune or even death to a village. Wow. Um, and so sadly, some of them are persecuted. Oh, this. Um, We've got quite a long history with eye eyes as well, haven't we? Can you tell us a little bit about Dole's history with eye eyes? Yeah, so uh, Gerald Dole went out to Madagascar in 1990 um, and while he was over there, he collected our sort of founder population for the IIs in Europe here. Um, so he brought six IIs back over with him um, and we actually later found out that one of the IIs, Patrice, had actually got some bullets embedded in him. We discovered that a few From years ago. From the wild? He'd been yeah, shot at? Yeah, he'd been shot oh, at. Oh no, so Patrice. He, he was one Patrice. of the lucky ones. Wow, okay. How much are they like us? Are they like us at all? Are they, um, are they nothing like us? <laughs> <laughs> They're like us in that they all have their own different personalities. Right, okay. And sometimes people are quite surprised that the, the small monkeys and the ayahs and the bats all have different personalities, but it's kind of like your pet dog or cat at home. Every single one of them's different. So we've got some who are really playful, some who are a little bit more shy and aloof, and we've got some who are super fussy about food. So we've got like with naughty children who are just like, oh, vegetables. We've got some who we sneak their vegetables in their delicious breakfast pellet and they don't even notice. <laughs> now, sometimes when you come up Jersey Zoo, it's a little bit tricky to see them. Can you give us any tips for anyone who wants to come up and catch a glimpse of an eye eye? Yes, I can, Dan. And um, because it's a little bit dark in there when you first go in, um, the reason behind that is because they're nocturnal, so we have to make it seem like night for them so that they'll be out and active. Um, so it's a little bit like when you step outside at night time from your brightly lit house, it takes a couple of minutes to your eye, for your eyes to adjust. Okay. So if you just wait for a couple of minutes, then you'll be able to see them really clearly. Also, look everywhere in the room. They like to be up in the trees, and so we've got nice, big, tall enclosures. So have a look towards the top of them. Um, and the other thing is, because they've got their massive, massive ears, um, they've got very sensitive hearing. So your best chance of seeing them behaving normally and out and wanting to come and say hi to you is if you're nice and quiet in there. OK. And what are the major threats now in the wild for, for eye eyes? Um, so there is still some persecution going on in, in some of the more remote villages. Um, but the main, the main threat for them is deforestation. They say Madagascar's lost a lot of its forests, especially over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and this has meant that not only have they lost the trees which they get their feed from, um, but they've lost their nesting sites and all the forests have become really fragmented and spread out. Um, and so it's really hard for the, the different little pockets of eye eyes to meet up and breed and kind of increase the population that way. Okay, so how important is this birth and how significant is this birth at Jersey Zoo of this oh, eye eye. It's, it's so important, Dan. Um, like we said, they're really endangered in the wild. Um, and there's actually only a really small captive population. So outside of Madagascar, there's only 57 animals. Wow. Um, and so every birth is something to have a massive celebration about, especially if it's a female, which she is. Lovely. Right, now we're going to get some questions from social media. Um, Emma? So first of all, an update on the Instagram poll. So we ran a poll early today asking people if they thought the baby eye eye was cre creepy or cute. And oh, <laughs> cute, cute, must be cute. Obviously cute. So 
81% of people said it was cute, and 19% of people said it was just a little bit creepy. They're wrong. So They're wrong. Right. It's, just, oh, it's beautiful. I just, no, I, completely cute, I would say. Definitely. We even had a discussion about this in our office earlier as well, so it's really getting people talking, but no, it's definitely cute. Um, so, first question from Alison, who asked, what's been the biggest highlight and also the biggest challenge of looking after the baby eye eye? Um, probably the biggest highlight is getting to see behaviours that we wouldn't normally see. Um, even at this age, should still be in the nest. So when we've had babies in captivity before, they're all hidden away by lots of branches and the mum's really protective. So it's been incredible to see what kind of tiny babies actually do when they're in the nest. Really amazing. Um, and then the biggest challenge is probably lack of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you there, I feel you. <laughs> um, and we also have a comment on social media from Sammy, who just simply said, great job, Rachel. So we agree. We agree. Well done. For, there's probably a lot of sleepless nights for you guys, but you've done a fantastic job. Um, so, yeah, we just want to give a huge shout out now to one of our fundraisers. As we mentioned before, we've had some people who've done incredible fundraising for us. And the three kayaking amigos great name managed to raise 1170 pounds for us so amazing thank you very much guys. thank you so much now rachel i i would love to sit and chat longer <laughs> but we've got loads to look forward to and i will be looking forward to following the progress of this baby io for the weeks and the days and the months and the years to come but in a few minutes time i'll be showing you all what happened to get me really chuffed on the north coast We've got Milo Parker and we've got Gorilla Babies. So there's still time for more questions as well. If you're staying with us, and I hope you are, this is how you can help. Jersey Zoo is the heartbeat of Durrell. And without it, the charity cannot survive. We need your help to provide the expert care to our beloved animals and to continue our work creating a wilder, healthier, more colorful world. Please show your love for Jersey Zoo by visiting us, donating to our Love Your Zoo appeal, joining as a member, adopting one of our amazing animals, shopping at our gift shop or online, staying in our award-winning wildlife camp. Together, with your help, we can ensure Jersey Zoo endures this global crisis and thrives into the future. If you go walking along Jersey's rugged north coastland, you're going to see some of the most spectacular scenery anywhere. You've got Jersey's fellow Channel Islands, Guernsey and Sark, France to the east and some beautiful wild nature. If you're really lucky as well, you're going to get to see a spectacular black bird with a red bill and it hasn't been here for a hundred years. I'm going to go and find out how it's returned back to these islands. A hundred years ago, with land practices changing, the red-billed chuff disappeared and became extinct on our island. This has never been easy land to farm. Small fields sloping down to the cliff edge and sea meant that changes in farming practice were inevitable. But this also meant a change in the habitat and where the chuffs would feed, a dense fern called bracken had taken over. Fortunately for our island and our coastline, Durrell and our partners have been working to re-establish this bird on island since 2013. How do you bring a bird back and restore it to its previous ranges? Jersey Zoo's Liz Corey has been leading this project and I'm gonna have a chat and find out how. Hey Liz. Hiya Dan. Welcome to Sorrel. Good to see you. Special fist bump. Over here? Yeah. All right, okay. Oh. Elegant. The, the Chuff Project is something that's been brewing in uh, a few people's heads for a long time, particularly um, those who'd been living in Jersey and seeing that there's a lot of habitat um, not being used as it should be. Really, if you look at it from a habitat and biodiversity point of view, this lovely lush green land is actually just this bracken, um, which has always been there, but had been um, managed in ways that people didn't fully appreciate before. We've lost uh, Yellowhammer, sill bunting was on the decline and the, the chuffs themselves disappeared. 
We started by getting in birds from Paradise Park to do a breeding program uh, because we needed the birds to release. Uh, and we weren't going to take birds from the wild. Uh, so we had our captive population at, at the zoo. We also had to uh, build the aviary uh, and design our methodology based on work we've done in Mauritius. Uh, and so that took a few years, but our first release was in 2013. We had to bring them back in again over winter. And then I guess our big push release was in the following year, in 2014. And they started breeding in the wild, which is the real bonus in 2015. So that's helped boost numbers where we may have lost a few naturally to, to peregrines um, or their, their own naivety at the start of not being used to the environment. That's then helped balance it out a bit with the birds breeding in the wild. So um, we're at a stage now where we have the first chick that was born in the wild now has his own offspring, which is great. When they're up in the air, they're very noticeable. And that's why we sort of chose them, if you will, as a flagship species, because a chuff, it's recognisable. It's got this red bill, but it also is um, very acrobatic flying. And they'll fly upside down, they'll tumble. They've also got this call, which is where the name came from, and that's recognisable out there when they're flying over. And so we've had quite a few members of the public realised that, you know, not at first they've sort of gone, what's that? And then seen our work and go, oh, that was a chaff. So this is an unringed chick that is fledged from its nest, probably in the quarry site, although there are a couple of nests around the north coast. Um, I think this is one of two that are still to be ringed. So if you hold bird and bag. I've got him. Don't drop him. No, no. <laughs> oh. He's fidgety, he knows I'm holding it. Bit of a regular. It's very exciting for me. I've, I've never, I've always wondered how you ring these little fellas, you know, because their legs are so small and it just seems such a delicate job. Some bits are. Um, some, like the plastic rings, are actually quite easy. First off is weight. So always with a hand underneath in case it slips. That's 405 grams. 405. Good. This is where you now are going to have to hold him. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, the technique, these two fingers around the neck. Right. Just gently. And then you've got the palm on the back. Yeah. Those two fingers. And then that. ideally let him grip you in a way, or her grip you in a way that doesn't hurt. Oh my God. <laughs> Dan, don't blow this. This is just, it's just a wrap around. So this is the relatively easy part. Okay. If you feel confident to drop that finger. There you go. It's lovely and warm. When they've been in the quarry sometimes, especially the adults foraging or nest building, they come back kind of squeaky because of the quarry rock dust. Okay. <laughs> in their feathers uh, and sometimes gray. All my ringing experience has been from um, the zoo birds, um, things from Madagascar Fodies, Java Sparrows, um, I'm trying to think to this, up to maybe cranes I might have done. So all, all <laughs> sides of different legs then you, you've dealt with? Yeah, you, you, you have to get in practice, it takes time and practice. So we released them in here first, so it gives them a bit of a breathing time to yeah. collect themselves. And then I'll go around, open the hatches, and probably within seconds or minutes, then the others will be around and come back. So first of all, take the hood off. Okay. Gets a bit flappy. Oh. And then just Is that take the top hand off. <laughs> wow, wow, that felt good just <laughs> letting her go there. This particular project is part of the Birds on the Edge project to try and look at coastal farmland restoration. So that is Durrell, the National Trust for Jersey and the States of Jersey. And then techniques that you learn here and in the zoo, how useful are they to other projects that we've got and other species that we work with? Immensely and I didn't fully appreciate that at the start. We've taken the work from Mauritius and adapted it for this project. So why doesn't another project adapt it <laughs> for this? And I didn't expect, uh, I didn't expect the success that we had here with this project. I also didn't expect the enthusiasm that it meant for other um, places in the UK where they've, the chuff isn't there anymore or 
the numbers are declining to the point where they're concerned they'll lose them. So, for example, Isla in Scotland is the only place now, well, Isla and Collinsey are the only place in Scotland. They're now looking at reintroducing Chefs to Kent and to the Isle of Wight and Dorset. And it's potential that these techniques and what we're doing and this whole setup and how we've done it will benefit those projects um, and have just as much success as we've had. Wow, what an amazing conservation success story right there. And Dan, I can't believe you actually got to hold a chop. What was that like? It was absolutely wonderful. The sound they make is fantastic, but to hold a little wild chuff in my hand was fantastic. Now I know that it's got a claret and blue ring, so I'm gonna be looking out for him whenever I get on the north coast. And I was really inspired actually, so I asked one of our bird experts, Glyn, um, what birds we might be able to find in the park now. So we've got blackbird, chaff, finch, wren, dunnock, black cap, chiff chaff, and reed warbler, which would be around the new flamingo boardwalk we've got down there. And these are all birds that you might get in your garden as well if you're in Jersey, so, um, and France, and maybe even in southern England as well. But it doesn't stop there. We've got the wood pigeon, the stock dove, the magpie, the swallow, and get this, the short-toed tree creeper. What oh, a name. Fantastic Absolutely name. fantastic. That's a great name. So if you, if you close your eyes and just listen for a moment, you might be able to hear some. Now, knock, knock. Who's there? Cook. Cook who? There's another one, you see. Look at that. First one I've heard this year. <laughs> <laughs> Just get, we'll, we'll come back to you later. You go. I, I apologise for that terrible joke there. <laughs> OK, now just over eight months ago, on the 15th of November 2019, one of our female Western Lowland gorillas, Bahasha, gave birth to a beautiful baby. So join us now is Mark from our mammal department, who's going to tell us all about Amari and how she's been getting on as our newest gorilla in the troop. So hi, Mark, how are you doing? Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. So I'm going to get straight in there and ask, how has being a father figure treating you? <laughs> Uh, it's been it's been good for the most part, uh, much less labour intensive than what Rachel has to go through. And since Bahasha basically does everything, um, I would say the first couple of weeks were very very stressful. Um, but apart from that, now it's it's pretty much clear sailing. It's it's all it's all good. You don't like losing too much sleep at the moment. No. So that's fine. <laughs> no, no, yeah. <laughs> so um, so take us back to sort of the beginning of last year. When did you first find out that Bahasha was pregnant? So we first had a positive test result. It was the end of May, uh, May 30th. Um, I, I did a pregnancy test. Um, it was positive, obviously, <laughs> um, but it, it was the, the first positive pregnancy test I'd ever seen. Um, immediately having done so many negative tests, I was like, well, this is wrong. <laughs> uh, so we set out and decided to, to do a, another test later on in the day, um, which came back positive again. <laughs> Oh, excellent. What was, what was the reaction from you guys when you found out? There must have been so much excitement. I so, yeah, really, really excited. Um, yeah, obviously that, that first test, I was like, nope. But um, <laughs> once, after getting the second one, it said the same thing. It was a digital test that said three weeks plus as well. So it said it twice. I kind of figured this actually must be true. <laughs> uh, so I phoned Gordon, our sort of head of orangutans. He came over. We both had a little celebration together. I messaged all the other ape keepers the, the good news. And then it, from that point, it was, it was sort of an excitement, but also a lot of, of anticipation and making sure that everything was you know, ready for every single scenario as and, as and when it happened. Yeah, it must be quite nerve wracking in some ways when you know you're pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah certainly, I'd, yeah, it, it, towards the end of pregnancy, there was a lot of sort of, you know, when, when is it gonna happen? When's yeah. it gonna happen? Is everything gonna be okay? So yeah, it, it was stressful but exciting. <laughs> Excellent, and did you have to do any particular training with Bahasha at all throughout the pregnancy? So uh, in terms of monitoring her pregnancy, we weighed her uh, very regularly. We have a set of scales. It's really easy to get the gorillas on them. So we kept a close eye on our weights because their weights, you know, naturally they will increase. Um, you do see a few different visual changes, which is quite nice to kind of see that matching up to the weights. Um, for training, um, a lot of the hard work was done before that first uh, test result that we got with Bahasha. Uh, because she had so many negative test results for, for a couple of years, really, um, we decided to start monitoring it a bit more closely in-house. And this took the form of collecting a huge amount of poo for three months. Uh, after that, it involved collecting a huge amount of pee. Um, to make it a little bit easier, we did train Bahasha to pee on command. So I could ask her to go for a wee-wee and she would go for a wee-wee. So because we had done all this training to get all these regular urine samples, it meant by the time that we decided 
Um, well, we've got a positive result. We want to check this every single week and make sure we're still getting positive results. We'll just ask her to go for a pee, get my sample, do a pregnancy test. Um, and so yeah, we say so we did test every every week. And um, I think between us, we did 25 pregnancy tests. I did 18 of those myself. So I would challenge anybody to beat that. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of a lot of pregnancy tests. Um, yeah, a lot of different brands as well. We we don't we don't have any favourites on the mammal team. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of tests, diff, lots of weighing, and, and yeah, just as I say she she was so smart and, and great with that training. It just made it really easy. Wow, so a very glamorous job by the way. <laughs> so everyone at home yeah. knows this is the true life of a keeper, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, tell us about the moment when she actually had the baby. How? When did you first realise? What was? We'll talk us through that. Uh, so uh, sort of again towards the end of the end of the pregnancy. I was very, very impatient. I, I was sort of quite honest to admit it. I, I was not patient at all. I had baby vibes so many times on many different weeks, well before she gave birth. Um, by the time it got to the 14th of November and I, I you know, said goodbye to the gorillas, went home. I didn't really think too much of it. Came in the next day, still not, you know, not really too fussed, went in to check them all, say hello. And she was just kind of sat there with a baby. <laughs> uh, so yeah, really nice surprise. Again, got very excited. I phoned Gordon, like, come over, have a look. Um, cause, you know, it's nice to have somebody else to check over as well. And then it's, yeah, just, just told the other keepers and we all just got really excited. But also then that is the, the sort of start of a kind of very stressful week because the first week um, after they're born is it, critical really to, to their kind of success and their health. And so it was a lot of, a lot of cautious optimism and a, a huge amount of excitement and, and yeah, just a lot of time staring at the internal cameras just trying to make sure that the baby was you know still moving breathing feeding um, but yeah just yeah it was it was fun <laughs> and what's the reaction kind of been like for the other gorillas other than Bahasha? so they've reacted as as much as, as we were sort of expecting and kind of hoped for they're all really really respectful of Bahasha certainly her kind of position in the group it has sort of improved and with the the sort of social stance of having a baby which you'd kind of expect to see and for the other two females Kahili and, and Kishka they they really really want to have a play in a hold but Bahash is still saying not yet <laughs> and it is very much on her terms but again it's nice that they kind of respect that and they respect her distance if she's feeling uncomfortable they will sort of move away which which is great and um, dad very minimalistic role he keeps everybody safe it's not quite the same workload as Bahasha <laughs> But he's, he's sort of getting a look in now, which is nice too. Um, there's been a couple of moments where he's been able to kind of stroke, a, stroke Amari's face and get a little bit of play time. Um, not really too much at the moment, but Bahash is just sort of being quite cautious, but very protective. But you get that with a, a first time mum. So yeah, they've reacted uh, you know, amazingly. Oh, excellent. Now, um, so when we eventually learned that Amari was a girl, it did take a little bit of time, but we finally got there. Um, and a lot of people watching will probably remember that it went out to a public vote. So you guys picked four names and the public could vote and eventually Amari was chosen. And the names that people could vote on were Amari, Aniko, Mahuri and Kapuki. So yeah, as I said, Amari was chosen. But was there a name that you were secretly <laughs> hoping you would win or were you quite happy with Amari? I, I will say I did, I did like all four names. And there was one that the keepers did like a little bit more, which was Mahuri, just because it translated to the word stamp. And Bahash's name translated to envelope. Not really sure what the decision making was there. Um, but if, you know, sort of poetically, we thought it would have been quite nice. But at the same time, I, I am very happy with Amari. And it, you know, I'm, I'm quite chuffed that the, the public chose that because it's quite nice. And you know, I, I say it to her a lot. She isn't reacting to it yet. Uh, but a little bit more time and we'll get there. But yeah, there was a lot of great choices, but yeah, Amari, a, a strong winner and a meaning strength, of course, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's a good fit for her, isn't it, really? Um, so what stage of development is Amari in now? What kind of do we expect to see over the coming months? So she is now just over eight months or eight and a half months old. Um, she, she's sort of developing as, as we would expect. Um, she's just over five kilos now. Um, so she's put on a, a decent amount of weight. Typically you'd sort of expect a, a baby gorilla to be around 2.2 kilos, that kind of range. Mm -hmm. um, she is able to carry herself around. She can hang off the ceiling. She can swing around and do whatever she wants. Uh, sometimes Bahasha actually struggles to kind of peel her back off of the ceiling. Um, if Bahasha wants to leave and Amari isn't keen. <laughs> Um, so yes, yeah, really, actually you're quite remarkably strong for an eight month old baby, really mobile and um, just developing, you know, as, as we would have hoped. Um, you do get a little bit of differences, different gorillas will sort of be a bit more advanced, a little bit less perhaps. There have been a few different gorilla births um, that I've known of sort of in the, the population. So Amari is sort of somewhere in the middle, I would say. It's not a competition, um, but she's definitely the cutest at least. Um, and for her, her kind of next step, because um, at the moment her main mode of transport is just to grip onto mum's arm or onto her chest. 
Um, and so for mum at the moment, she's sort of dragging five kilos around everywhere she goes. Um, and so at some point, your sort of next step is to upgrade to a, a gorilla piggyback. Um, but Hasha definitely knows that she can carry a gorilla on her back because she used to carry Indigo around, um, Kahili's son, um, even when he was sort of five years old, so much, much heavier. So at some point, whenever Bash is ready, she'll just get Amari on the back. And then, yeah, that's, that's sort of what we're looking forward to. I know, I know a few people on site are looking forward to it. Leslie has mentioned it countless times to me. Um, and I keep saying, yeah, it'll probably be another two weeks or so, but it's probably been about three months, maybe. Um, it will just be another two weeks. So, maybe oh, soon. I think we're all looking forward to seeing a gorilla yeah. piggyback. That sounds incredibly cute. Um, so, finally, are you starting to see a personality develop with Amara? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's quite nice, too, actually. You sort of see them stop being a, a little blob, essentially, to, to being a, a little baby gorilla, a little more fun, a, a little more playful. Um, she's very inquisitive, which you would expect from a, a young gorilla. And mum will sort of chew little bits of food, drop them on the floor so Amari can have a little nibble and start to, to taste some of the solid objects. She is copying mum. And um, if they're outside and um, browsing on stuff like hazel or, or willow, um, there's a lot of trees they love to eat. And so the gorillas will kind of scrape it through their teeth because they'll eat the bark too. So Amari is, is now kind of chewing on little bits and starting to copy. Um, copy our mum which is quite cool to see that but she is very playful the two of them will have a, a little wrestle and um, she's always trying to sort of climb on mum's back or climb on her head or stick her hand in her face and that kind of thing even if she's trying to sleep um, which I don't think Bahaja always appreciates but and um, they do have a nice little play together and she's shown a, a little bit of a cheeky side too and um, particularly mornings and evenings if we're trying to give Bahasha a drink we'll sort of pour uh, a drink from a measuring jug and Amari will always try and come over and shove her hand in it or sort of push it away um, so Bash has sort of had to perfect drinking was also kind of swatting her child off um, <laughs> yeah just yeah what she's starting want. to get really fun it is great <laughs> oh, excellent. it sounds like you guys are doing a fantastic job there with Amari so well done to you guys Thank and you. now I think we have time for a few questions from social media so we invite Dan back in none of your jokes this time I don't want any of that going on <laughs> yeah, not again. So I've a jacket the sun's <laughs> gone behind the, the manor house now but these questions and comments are warming me up so ryan's asked what's the best part of being a gorilla keeper uh best part of being a gorilla keeper is is i can wake up wake up in the morning and i'm not too worried about going to work because there's no kind of stress there's no like oh not sort of dread in the day it's nice to be able to wake up and be like yeah i'm going to spend the day with the gorillas especially with the baby now it is wonderful and it is, it's sort of nice to have that it's almost excitement when you wake up in the morning it's, it's never like a dull day up here and it's always just a privilege to kind of work with um, animals as, as special as the gorillas Sounds a dream. Sounds a dream. And <laughs> Anne agrees with you because she said it's a wonderful zoo. I could spend hours just watching these beautiful <laughs> gorillas. So you've got that job. Yeah, it is, it's nice to watch. <laughs> now, uh, with donations, we'd just like to thank you again so much. It costs over £130,000 a month to run Jersey Zoo. So thank you all for every pound that you're giving. It really is gonna help us so much. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you very much for Mark for giving us a lovely insight there into the life of little Amari. Everyone sure loves a baby gorilla, don't they? <laughs> now, keeping on the theme of baby animals, we're gonna show you a short film where we'll hear from some of our young animals about their hopes for the future. Since our inception, we've had the same forward mission statement, saving species from extinction. And it's still at the heart of everything we do today. So take a look at this. When I grow up, I want to be pink. When I grow up, I want to live in a jungle. I want to be scared of the I want to swing through the treetops. I want to eat so much fruit than I can eat. When I grow up, I just want to eat lots of bugs. I want to sing my heart out night and day. I want to live on the river and swim everywhere. I want to climb a mountain. When I grow up, I want to dig a den and live in it with all my friends. I want to be totally camouflaged. 
I want to eat slugs for a breakfast, lunch and dinner. I want to be in the dam. I'm going to be a snake. They just in the cave for a long time. When I grow up, I'm going to be leader of the troop. I'm going to be king of the jungle. I want to join the flock and travel the world. I want to stay up all night. When I grow up, I want to be a runner. I want to be a jumper. When I grow up, I'll be stronger than my dad. And my strong might will my muscle. I want to be as tall as a tree. I want to live in a world where I have the future. I want to be free. When I grow up, I don't want to be the last one. Of course, animals don't have a voice. We are their voice and with your continued support, we can make sure they are heard and we are all louder for them. Now, are you a fan of the hit TV show, The Dolls? Of course you are, it's an instant classic, great family viewing, and any fan will recognize our next guest as the young Jerry. Milo Parker is a fantastic actor who's already worked in Tim Burton movies alongside Sir Ian McClellan, and he's a lovely guy we're proud to have as a Durrell ambassador. Milo, it's great to see you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Dan. How are you? I'm good as well. Yeah, it's really Fantastic. good to see you because you were at the zoo this time last year, pretty much volunteering. How was your experience then? Oh, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, I had, I, had, I had so much fun. I mean, thank you for organising it, Dan, because it was, it was the best week. Um, I got to work all over the zoo. I got to work on... Um, I got to work with the orangutans, with the bears. I even got to work on the, on the farm. I didn't realise that, um, that the vast majority of the food that the animals actually eat is, is, is grown on site. So um, that was really interesting to, to, to find out. And the scale of the operation on Jersey alone really surprised me. So yeah, it was fascinating to see how everything worked. We, we did get you moving a lot of poo, didn't we? Yeah, that was, there were, there were some, uh, you know, it was, it was a very real experience, you know, <laughs> got to do all sorts. Now, of course, the Dolls is being repeated again. It must be fantastic, bring back some lovely memories for you. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's weird as well, though, because, I mean, I'm still not out of, it's been two years since we, we filmed the last series, and I'm still not out of the mindset of, because normally we filmed it in um, sort of late August to December. Um, so I'm still in the mindset of thinking, oh, I should be going out there this time of year, you know. But it, it's nice to see, see it back on again. And I think the world needs the Durrells at the minute um, in these uncertain times. So it's great to see it back. Did playing Jerry inspire a, a love for animals or was that always there with you anyway? Yeah, I think um, it definitely um, exaggerated it. I think it was the, the constant close contact I had with, with the animals on set almost day in, day out. And seeing the keepers um, interact with the animals so effortlessly and, and constantly was, was, was really fascinating for me. So it definitely inspired a, a deeper love of animals for me, for sure. Fantastic. Did you have any favourites on set? Oh, you put me on the spot, Dan. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> see, normally I, I, I say, I say Mossop the dog who, who played Roger who was gorgeous. But I think uh, series four, we had some lemurs um, on the show and um, I think they may just edge it for me. They were just gorgeous to work with. I remember you really loved them here as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they were just, they're just so, such beautiful animals. They're just so relaxed and chilled out. It's just, they, they, I, I could just sit and watch them all day. They're beautiful. What, what was your favourite animal at Jersey Zoo? Can you remember? Yeah, well, um, I think I think it has to be the um, the orangutans, um, uh, and uh, I got to work with them on my on my last day, and um, they're definitely the muckiest as well, which which wasn't as nice, but um, they're just so adorable and, and 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 lovely, and I just love spending time with them, and you got you can get up so close to them um, in the zoo, so it was great. Milo, you're an ambassador for Doral. We're very proud to have you as an ambassador, and biodiversity loss is increasing at. Uh, a scary rate. How important do you see Jersey Zoo and Dole's work going into the future now? 
I think it's crucial. Um, I think, you know, um, Dar Darrell's message of a, of a wilder, healthier, more colourful world has never been more uh, poignant uh, than, than during this, this, this pandemic. I mean, things like the illegal wildlife trade, habitat loss, um, the decline in species. I think I, I only read this morning a statistic. Um, I think it was three billion animals had been killed or affected during the horrific bushfires in Australia last year. And I mean, it's, it's statistics like that that really, really make you realise how how crucial um, Doral's Doral's work is. So I would urge you know anyone who's watching who's in a position to to donate, please do so because it, it really is crucial that Doral continues to do to the work it's doing around the world. Thank you for that. And what about you? Are you up to much at the moment? Are there many projects going on? Or has the, the pandemic and lockdown affected the, the film and TV industry as well? Well, yeah, I, th I think it's like, it's like everything, really. It's all sort of ground to a halt. Uh, there's not really not much going on at all at the minute. But uh, I think there's signs that things are starting to, to pick back up. I've had a few requests for auditions. And so hopefully um, we can get back out there soon. But in the meantime, it's just towing the party line and, and focusing on the A-levels, I suppose. <laughs> Excellent. Well, look, we're going to have some social media questions. I know that's going to be... Uh, uh, Emma, can you, have you got some? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. There's, your fans have been in touch. Yeah, there's a few <laughs> doll fans out on social media at the moment. Um, Love it. So, first of all, that famous straw hat you wear in all the promos, where can people yeah. buy one from? <laughs> Oh, I don't. I managed to just about forget about that. Um, <laughs> I actually had it uh, specially made for me in series one, but it was uh, my head actually, because I grew so much uh, from when we started filming until we finished, they had to actually keep stretching it out year on year with this and because um, it just wouldn't fit me anymore. But I think you can buy them. I've seen them around in, in places like Corfu Town. So on the island, I think you can you can buy them. But I, I, I advise against it. They're very hot and they cause a lot of bother. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then some of you want to know, how do you become an actor? What's some of your top tips, would you say? Um, well, I personally, I got really lucky. Um, I, I, it was quite a cliched story. I did a school play um, back, I think it was, I was in year four. Um, and um, I started going to a club and, and the person who ran it, uh, her husband, um, is, is an, is worked for an agency. And um, he, he came to one of our sessions uh, and, and, and you know, asked if, if I'd be interested in joining the agency. And of course, I was like, absolutely. Um, but my top tips would probably be, um, you know, you, you've got to really love it. And um, the hard work will really pay off if you keep trying and you keep, you know, um, auditioning for things. If you can get an audition, then it's, it's, it's absolutely worth, worth the, the, the hard work that you, that you put in. Oh, and, and finally, if there's an opportunity in the future, in years to come, for you to come back and play Gerald Durrell again as an older person, would you do it? Oh, 100%. I think, you know, any excuse to get back out to Corfu or out to Jersey, maybe, I think it would be, it would be a really fun, fun thing to do. Oh, well, we'd love to see you, Milo. <laughs> um, so thank you very much to our amazing fundraisers. We're going to give a little shout out to them as well, particularly to the Musicals Originals Choir and Team Maurice Smith. Thank you very much. You guys have been doing lots of great work. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Milo. Thank you for all your support. We look forward, Thank you're you. always welcome here in Jersey and we look forward to seeing whatever you're going to be doing next. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, guys. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks, Milo. <laughs> now, wow, what a fantastic show we've had and I've had a fantastic time. Hopefully you've learned a little bit like I have doing this about the team and the species that we work with. Please let us know. Maybe we should do another one. What do you think? But whatever you think, please continue supporting Dole. What we do here is save species from extinction. We did it yesterday, we did it today, and with your support, we're gonna do it tomorrow and it's going to continue. We need your support, it's vital work, so please, please help us. Yeah, so a massive thank you to all of the guests who've been on the show and to each and every member of the Dole team, both here at the zoo and around the world to continue to do amazing work saving endangered wildlife. And of course, a huge thank you to you as well. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for sticking with us despite the uh, technical dif difficulties there. And my jokes. <laughs> and his jokes. So if you're still with us, well done, you persevered. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for getting involved on social media and donating to our appeal. Your support is so much appreciated by all of us and you really are making amazing things happen. So with that said, Goodbye for now, and we look forward to seeing you at the zoo again very soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.